Welcome to Vegas. You know what it is, Identiverse 2023. It's your boy, The Identity Jedi. We're going to be here all week. We're going to walk on the floor. We're going to see what's the latest and greatest. And of course, you know I got to get the keynote on Thursday, get the people going. This is what they came for. Right now, we're about to make the walk over. See y'all some movies. Let's roll. Everybody, welcome back to the Identity Jedi Show. We are live from Las Vegas, Nevada, Identiverse 2023, hanging out. And of course, you guys know I couldn't do a live show in Vegas without the godfather of identity, Mr. Richard Bird himself. <laughs> What's up, man? Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to survive the heat in Las Vegas. So, um, but it's a dry heat. Yeah. Yeah. But it always makes it better. Yeah, other than that, it's inside of an airplane every week. Um, <laughs> off doing, uh, you know, d doing the stuff that I do now, API security. Um, I, I will kind of just like, uh, you know, address the big question in the room. I've been doing it for about the last year. People are like, man, like, why'd you get out of identity? I kind of laugh because I, I say, you know, look, like in 24 months, API security is going to be authorization security, which is non-existent. Right. Right. People go, wow, we got, you know, we've got authentication tokens and we have authorization tokens. I'm like, that's not security, right? right? Those are keys and locks. And, and so I think that we'll see it morphing of the API security space uh, to cover a huge part of the authorization plane. Um, but that's, you know, that's future casting. Right. right now, there's plenty of stuff broken in APIs. <laughs> we don't even have to worry about that stuff yet. Um, but it's been a blast and it's been a blast being outside of the identity space proper and helping companies and talking with organizations about identity, um, you know, more as a, a freelance agent for good, so. So what, you jumped right into it, right? So what would, you think, what would you say has been the biggest difference between like coming outside of identity and now, you know, from a, from a security standpoint, the conversations that you're having with customers and, and how they see it? Sure, I, I think when, when you look at API security or AppSec um, in particular, um, the one thing that's different is, is something that I left off of about a year ago when I kind of officially stepped away from identity solutions companies, um, which was I was making a big stink about the fact that um, in identity, we don't use security language, right. right? We talk about access administration. We talk about access management. We talk about attributes, roles, entitlements. We don't talk about attack surfaces. We don't talk about um, exploits. We don't talk, we just, we talk about identity things. Right. And then the, you know, the whole universe of our, you know, cybersecurity, you know, brothers and sisters out there have no idea what we're talking about. So the API security side for me has been an ability to get back into, you know, kind of operational and product security that, that does have security language as its foundation. And so it's been really, really interesting because it's, it's fun and it is healthy for me to be talking about attack surfaces and reducing your attack surfaces, to talk about notions like trust in the way of implied and persistent trust, like stop doing authenticate once, provide access forever. Right, right. right? Stop assuming that authorization is what you should do because authentication happened. Um, you know, so it, it really has been fun to be back in kind of what I would call the true guts and wires of security. Um, and I think that you know, in the last year, I've seen some indications that identity is beginning to trend that way, especially with things like ID, or ITDR yep. and, you know, those types of notions. Um, I'd like to think that because I was making noise, maybe, <laughs> maybe the folks at Gartner or somebody paid attention um, and, and thought maybe we should start using security language in this space. But that's really been the biggest difference. And, and working with folks that are really, really deep uh, in the, in, like I said, in the guts and the wires and the language um, and the code of, of things like APIs and application security. Um, it's, it's been a good way to get my feet back up underneath me. Yeah, that's nice, man. And it, uh, once again, like you headed my next question, like the, the ITDR topic, uh, Gardner's been talking a lot about cybersecurity mesh architecture. So I do agree with you in the fact that I think, and that's one of the things I'm looking forward to this week to see how much it's kind of talked about, that identity is definitely moving more towards security. And they're trying to figure out how do we talk about this, right? Like, how do we talk about security in an identity-centric way? And what does that mean? And I think we're going to go through this kind of stumble the next couple of years of figuring it out. And so we finally realize it's like, 
oh, they kind of have all this defined for us. We should just start talking like these guys. And we're going to see if we figure that out. But that's one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in attending the sessions this week and seeing like how, how people are talking about that, how they're addressing that. ITDR has been a pretty you know, hot topic and it's, it's like all new things in this industry, right? You ask somebody right now, you're gonna get five different answers about what it is. And so I'm definitely interested to see like what those are and what we end up coming to. Uh, to for, for you, what are you most looking for? Do you look at some of the sessions that you wanna check out or, or themes that you wanna kind of pick up this week? Well, first I wanna riff on what you just said because I think there's a really important you know, uh, set of topics bundled up in what you just dropped, right? And I'm gonna look at the camera and I'm gonna say, the pings of the world and the octaves of the world, the oracles of the world, the IBMs of the world, you need to understand that there are a whole category of startup companies now um, over the last 24 to 36 months whose value proposition is providing security for identity. They're identity companies. Right. Right. And, and I'm not going to be you know, crude enough to say, you know, like the emperor has no clothes because I've worked in the large identity solution yeah. space, right? But it's become very, very apparent that there are perceived, whether they're real or you know, not, perceived gaps and whether or not um, the entrenched identity players are actually providing identity security. Right. Now, I think that kind of tips into IT, ITDR and identity mesh and the identity fabric concepts yep. that are coming up. Absolutely. There's a part of me that worries a little bit, and this is what I really want to see on the floor. There's a part of me that worries a little bit that um, all of the creation of these um, you know, expectations around ITDR and identity fabric and all of that um, are really a are, are really addressing twenty or thirty years of shortcomings in the way that we've been doing identity. Yeah. Right. And the question becomes back to what you said. The question becomes is is there an appetite in the market that's been trained and indoctr indoctrinated on access administration? Is there an appetite in the market for solutions that are additive to or ride along with? these identity players, or do those large identity players kind of wake up, realize the existential threat that they're going to, you know, continue to face with these companies that are rising up, you know, addressing this perceived gap, and will those solution providers then incorporate those capabilities into an overall platform? So I think there's a lot of questions, and one of the things that I'm looking for, uh, you know, at this Identiverse is to watch which way the compass needle is moving, yeah. right? I want to see if, if ITDR has legs. I want to see if things like, you know, the, the Gartner notions around, um, you know, identity fabric and meshes, whether that has legs. I also want to kind of see where people are going around elimination of implied and persistent threat or uh, access uh, and trust as it relates to zero trust models. So those will be the two. I want to see where ITDR is going. I want to see where ZT is going. And that's really what I'm going to be looking for on the floor. Yeah, I, I'm interested to... I didn't get a chance to check them out a lot or talk to them at, at RSA, but CyberArk. And they're heavily leaning into this identity security platform play. Like, they are all in on this, yep. right? To, to the point where I would almost say aggressively marketing that, that they are, like, the, the sole identity security platform. And so I'm interested to see what they think that is and how they define it. And from the other practitioners and customers here, how they respond to that. If, if they agree that that's the, the same way, right? Because I do agree. I think over the next, you know, 24, 36 months, we're going to see this need from identity companies to feel like, hey, we got to get back into the front door. Like for the for those that don't have it, right? They're not SSO. They're not an authentication, not doing anything with orchestration. They really more on the heavy administration side. There's going to be this fight that like, hey, we're going to have to get back in that front door to have something there. And for some of the bigger identity companies that kind of already have that, how do we continue to evolve and, and grow this, right? And show that that value, right? And it's going to be very interesting to see how they apply to that. I, I When Okta first announced IGA and PAM, right, I, I kept talking about it, I put in all my newsletters, I was like, the platform wars have begun, right? Like, Okta fired the first shot, and we've just been watching the shots go back and forth. Tom Bravo steps in, snatches people up, right? Cyborg snatches up companies in the last couple of years, and now they're talking about, you know, I did a security platform. Radiant Logic snatches up, right? You're just seeing all these after actions as, as things have been consolidating, which you know, we've been saying has been coming for years. So I, I want to see how that plays out this week, how they market, how customers respond to it, and then how that matches up with some of the conversations from the sessions. Because uh, I think it's going to be, 
I think it's going to be interesting to use this as a tell of kind of what's coming. And I know that, you know, it's going to be, a lot of people are going to be cautious because the, the economic market we're turning into, so nobody's going to overstep too much. But I'm going to be interested to see who the aggressive ones are that kind of come out and really push and market towards something. Uh, switching to sessions, any, any session that you saw that kind of caught your eye that you're interested in checking Yours, out? Yours, man. Well, like, okay. <laughs> easy. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I've, I've actually kind of decided intentionally to leave myself fluid coming into this, right? Okay. Um, and this is my first time um, not presenting in six years. So I get a chance to really kind of take a step back, look at what is happening, yeah. what conversations are happening on the floor. I'm excited about tonight's you know, opening session, right? I wanna talk to you know, the old regulators, regulars, plus all the people that are, you know, that I know of, that are you know, practitioners in the enterprises, lots of old customers in that. And I want to see where they're inclining to, yeah. right? What I can tell you is, is that um, if it if it's another session on how to clean up your active directory, <laughs> I probably ain't going, right? Or if it's another session on why MFA is important, <laughs> I'm probably not going, right? It, there, I'm here. I, there's a certain part of my attendance here that is about my my odyssey, my journey that really started a year ago when I made an intentional decision to leave the identity solution space, um, my being here is to find the nuggets, to find the innovations that re-motivate me as an identity solutions practitioner, right? Um, and, and hearing a rehash of you know what to do about your AD again is not the conversation that I want to have for the 24th year in a row, right? right? So I want to I want to see innovation and I want to see people so I'm gonna I'm gonna base my session attendance off of where I see people's conversation directing energy and interest I mean, I'm gonna pop in and I'm gonna check them out yeah. right and I, I just you know I it, you know I can't have a conversation without having a contentious statement warning right <laughs> I made some noise you know last year about one of the reasons why I felt like I needed to step out was I wasn't seeing innovation right. anymore right and, um, and, and that still troubles me, but I think, you know, kind of the tidal wave of AI, uh, yeah. the tidal wave of uh, breaches and exploits, like, I mean, here's the bad news. You know, we ought to say the, loud, uh, this, the quiet parts out loud, right. right? Here's the bad news. The Verizon DBIR is going to come out again, and 80% of breaches are going to be through access and identity, and the largest problem in cybersecurity is going to be flagged again is probably ransomware. Yep. And and this is the, the hard truth that we refuse to face in identity. Ransomware is a successful identity exploit at its core, right? Ransomware is an identity exploit. If ransomware is booming, we in the identity organizations, we in the identity community need to look at ourselves and say, why are we messing up so bad? And we still haven't had that self-reflective moment. We think ransomware is somebody else's problem right. relative to the security stack, yep. right? But if you know how a ransomware attack happens, you know that it is nothing more than, you know, credential aggregation and access and, you know, all the bad things that we know that people used to go, use, do to get into databases, they do the same pathway to just lock down assets and then hold them up for, you know, for, for ransom or whatever else they do. And, um, and I'm still looking for that that bright shining moment of self-revelation within the identity trades that we've really got to change the way that we're thinking. So I hope to see some of that while I'm here. Yeah, <clears throat> well, to add a little bit to that, right, it's because identity, they found their little niche in this little corner and they said, we're just gonna stay here. They didn't have to, because if we're not active, if we're not active in these discussions about how we're defending and protecting these access, at, assets, we're not responsible for it. Like none of these, None of these organizations wanted to create a product and be in the direct line of fire. They didn't. Right. They wanted to say, hey, like administration, this is hard, we'll deal with this and we'll automate over here. And so I, my thought on it is I would dare to say that identity became security accidentally because somebody marketed it that way, they thought it was cool, and then we all just went with it for two years ahead of it. And then we said, oh crap, we actually gotta start really acting like security, which means we have to start actively getting engaged in these things and how do we help stop, prevent these breaches and ransomware. We gotta start thinking of things like threats and vulnerabilities. And so it's, it's this whole skill set now that they're trying to figure out if they want to build. Yep. And 
when you, the biggest thing about becoming a corporation and you become successful, you get capitalized is you slow down. Yeah. You don't want to take as many risks anymore. So I, I, I do want to see like how these, these newer companies that have come up in the last 24 months, especially around ITDR, because of the fact of what they're saying, they're leaning into automation, they want to be more involved, how they're, how they're marketing that, and again, how the customers that we see here, how they're receiving that message, and whether or not it's resonating with the identity security leaders. And that always seems to come back to the CISO, the security leaders, because now it's like, okay, this is, this is going to become more of your world and your reality. How are you, how are you blending the two? Yep. And how do they see it? So it should be good. So always, man, appreciate you coming through. Happy to be here. Anytime you ask me. Yep. So till next time, it's Identity Jedi Show. We're going to be here all week. We're going to have all kinds of great interviews, feedback, things coming for you. Catch you next time. Hey, what's up? This is Cedric Bellamy, a.k.a. Legacy City. Year three, we back at Identiverse. Back around, we're going to be covering what new cyber things going on, what new products. And I'm here with special guests, my special team, good visuals as well. Hi, okay, welcome back. This is Cedric Bellamy. I'm here at Identiverse again, Identiverse 2023. Here I'm with Mr. John. Mr. John been in this thing about, what, about two years, safe to say? Yep, two, three yep, years? Two years Definitely. So what, I'm going to ask you these questions. You can answer them in what order you want to. Um, what cons have you seen? What pros have increased? And what you looking for in this year's convention? Yeah, so uh, what I can tell you is... Uh, We've got over 2,500 people here this year. It's up about 30% over last year. Um, a great exhibit hall, which will be next door. Over 120 vendors. Um, and really the, the whole community here for the identity marketplace. So how, is it, how important is Identiverse and everything, information that comes out of here for those who are getting new companies or want to get into this field or identity, how important is this convention is to their future steps. Yeah, so this is the most critical event for education, networking, and understanding of the market and industry. So if you're whether you're a beginner and trying to understand the, the, the beginning pieces of it to one of the pioneers in the marketplace, you have to be here. Um, it brings the whole community together and this is the ultimate place. If you're in identity and security, you need to be here. Everybody, welcome back to the Identity Jedi Show. You know what it is, it's your boy Dave Lee. Got another special guest here at Identiverse. You know, we've been here all week having conversations, seeing all what's going on in identity. And today, we got Jordan Burst coming by. We're going to have a little conversation, talk about some diversity and inclusion and what we're seeing in the identity field. Jordan, good to have you here, bro. Yeah, appreciate you having me. <laughs> uh, when is your session again? Yeah, so Thursday uh, around 11, uh, 11 15. Okay. I'll be make sure to be there. I'll be, I'll be nice and recovering. Nah, it's going to be a good talk. We're yeah. going to be talking through. Uh, so I, a, a dual hat, of course, I work with Secure, who, who does identity verification, but I also dual hat uh, and uh, sit on the board of uh, directors for Kantara Initiative and helping them with their DEIA work, uh, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Yeah, awesome. And I, one of the things I've noticed this year with the, with the sessions, right, I, I saw at least three different sessions talking mm -hmm. about diversity, equity, and inclusion this year, yeah. which... I want to say is a is a max for Identiverse. I think this is the most I've ever seen. Usually there's like one or two. There's like one or two, yeah. I want to feel like maybe we had three maybe like a year ago. Yeah. But I, I will say this. When I looked at the titles, I felt like it was a lot more intentional right. this year, right. which leads me to believe that maybe they're getting a little bit more open to having the conversation. In the years that you've been here and, and going on those topics, how have you felt like the response to some of the topics has been? I, mean, I think generally, like across the community, everyone realizes that something needs to be done right. uh, here, and and it's like a there's always been the the beating of the drum, and each year there's trying to find the, what the fresh take is, and like how do you further advance or have the the conversation uh, around the subject, and given all of the, uh, especially for those who are attending from the government space, you know, there's been a lot of talk about. Uh, equity and inclusion from the federal standpoint. Uh, and so from there, they're trying to take their cues and understand from the identity community, how do you actually translate that into meaningful outcomes right. uh, going forward? What do you, if you had a magic wand right now, right? What's the, what's the biggest thing that you would fix 
that you're saying is the biggest blocker to, to making sure that this becomes more of a thing. So there's this gap, and it's 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 one of the things that I'm trying to do through the the Qatar initiative. Uh, but we actually have a, a terrible uh, time measuring uh, impact to different communities for identity solutions overall, and that is actually uh, creating this scenario where we keep applying fixes as an industry where that don't actually meet uh, folks where they are. There's right. a lot of assumptions, and it's because measurement, uh, according to folks, is hard. They're you know trying to understand what is the, the actual change and how does it impact different communities and uh, more importantly uh, do we continue to put everyone in this this one box uh, especially when you're talking about underserved communities there's different considerations as to you know why they're able to access digital identity systems or why they're not uh, and so for me I would you know Im immediately uh, put in the the foundation in order to help with this measurement so we were able to actually take proactive measures to improve uh, for the long run All right <clears throat> what would you what do you think we can do like at a conference like this to help to help move the conversation? Right? I, I feel like I feel like we, we have the, the conversations that I have about it always at the technical level. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we're finally this is getting the technology is moving us to a, a position where the use cases, it's now a lot more kind of social level, like less technical, more as we always say in this field, more of the soft skills. Like we need to understand more about what the community is and how they use it. What are some of the things that we can do here, whether it be sessions or maybe groups, that we can think help kind of raise that level of conversation? Right, so you know, I, I try to actually think about a lot about this in, in terms of how are we getting the, the maximum impact? How are we trying to get more folks to the conversation? In reality, we need to elevate the dialogue, right? There's a, a couple sessions here and there. Uh, it, it would be fascinating for me to as part of some of the main keynotes to actually further emphasize where we're seeing the breakdowns. You know, one of the, the keynotes uh, yesterday uh, highlighted how, you know, AI, there's a, the uh, ability to apply it for good and then there's bad, right? And right. you have uh, the bad application of AI with digital identity, it leads to a lack of trust. To take it a step further, I would have loved to have seen someone talk about the impact to people when there is that breakdown in trust. Right. And more importantly, when you look at the different uh, demographics, uh, uh, groups that are impacted, understanding how they're further left out of the process. If you take it that step further, then we're able to have that aha moment collectively uh, as uh, a community in order to try to make real change. Otherwise, we're just talking about you know the technology itself, right? To your point, uh, and, and so for me, it is we we really need to start to incorporate it uh, natively into a lot of the d dialogue that we're having instead of thinking about it as like bespoke or one-off sessions. Yeah, I feel like people think it's. Um that the problem is a myth, that it's like, 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 like oh, it's yeah. not a real problem. Oh, yeah. And it's because, to your point, they don't take it that far. Right. Um, it was, I was telling the, you know, the team earlier about how, you know, how we first met and connected to Identiverse. And when I said it on that panel, why I was so excited to see it, because like years before, I had done a diversity talk here and talking about, I brought up examples of how, you know, we saw a gentleman get committed of a crime that he didn't commit because mm -hmm. facial recognition tagged him as the wrong person because it had their algorithm had problem telling the difference between melanated pictures. Yep. And the picture that they use as a source picture was not well lit. Yep. It was like for all of us that have melanin, look, right. lighting matters, right? right? right, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why and because it's like the, the features do kind of change. And so, you know, you know, with that we don't we don't take it to that level enough to say like here are the impacts that it's that it can can actually have. And so Looking at how Identiverse is changing, I think this is my, call it like fifth or sixth Identiverse. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you know, we were kind of talking about earlier and I was talking with the guys is like looking around. I was like, this is the first time probably I would say I've seen double digit black people. Yeah. Like at this conference. Yeah. Which I think is, which is huge, right? It's, it's not big numbers. I mean, there's probably roughly around 2,500 people here, mm -hmm. but more so than it has been in the past. And I think part of it, you know, is doing a better job at conferences like this, like marketing this to the people that are in this industry to get them to come, right? right? Even if it's just listening and, and, and taking place, that's fine. It's got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully working that through the panels to get, you know, more sessions. I, I will say, I think the, 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 the panelist selection, the, the speaker selection has been more diverse. We've seen a lot Absolutely. more of that on, on the speakers, but uh, so I, I see the progress. I always get frustrated because it's slow progress, but slow progress is better than none whatsoever. Right. Um, 
what is as you start to to look forward, and I don't know, you know, how much longer you know you're going to be, you know, coming to speak to these events. Um, what are some of your thoughts on maybe things that we can do, like as speakers, to work with Identiverse to kind of open some of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think you know, for the speakers in particular, especially as you're doing the the evaluation of the content and the curation, right? It would it would be very interesting for me to have almost like a people impact uh, track associated, with it, right? Mm. Being able to talk into, you know, as we talk about pass keys rolling out, or we talk about the advent or or the continued usage of mobile devices, what does it actually translate to in terms of people? And how are they impacted? You know, one of the things, I know we've talked about this before, but we, one of the use cases that are fascinating to me that we just kind of continue to gloss over is that not everyone has a smartphone, right? right? You talk to my grandma, she called it a dumb phone. Uh, and <laughs> particularly that's her flip phone at the end of the day. And we keep assuming that everyone has yeah. access to these tools and it's by choice in a lot of cases, right? Some folks just don't like the idea of having all that uh, connectivity uh, at the end of the day, right? right? And, and are we designing our solutions? Are we talking about the impact of these things, these things we're putting in place, and how it, uh, how it will affect those communities, and how are we are seeking to bring them into the conversation, right? If we're not doing it, and we're not making that a core tenant in the way in which we're talking about these sessions and setting them up, we're just gonna continue to, to leave folks behind ultimately. But I will give credit to the fact that there is some intentionality today and how they are trying to uh, have more of these dialogues, right? There, it, to your point, there's more sessions related to this. There's right. more representation uh, in particular. And I think that just as a community, again, we, we've we long said that there has to be better uh, approaches to bringing uh, more equitable outcomes uh, for individuals. I think now it's really about us rallying to make sure that we're putting the, the energy and emphasis behind it such that we can actually see the change that we want uh, ultimately, not only in these programs, but then ultimately across the industry and the solutions. Yeah, and, and I'll say this, and I want to clarify for anybody like watching or listening. <clears throat> it is a critique against Identiverse, but, it, but it's not a bad one, right? I, I think Identiverse has grown to be this conference that it is, and it started, it was for the practitioners, right? I talked to, to Andre Durant like, earlier in the year when I was kind of preparing for this and asking him, like, what was it, what was his thought process when he wanted to start this? And, mm -hmm. and he talked a lot about, like, synergy and having an area where, like people could just connect and talk about things and that natural synergy would just flow and, and that's how you kind of get these ideas kind of going forward. And I get that. As a, as, a, as a practitioner, I love that. You always want to talk to other people and, you know, get new ideas and bounce things off of each other. Right. But I think now, you know, Identiverse has grown from that. I mean, this is now 20 some odd years this conference has been going. I mean, it's, it's changed from Cloud Identity Summit to different things. But I think now it's starting to get to that presence where we can say, <clears throat> let's Let's still put the practitioner at the center. That's great. We want yep. people to learn, have that stuff, whatever. But I think we can start leaning out more like with, with some of these tracks. And instead, what I would like to see is instead of vendors coming in and saying, like, this is where things are going, let's also have like a track for the customers and people to say, this is, this is where we would like to see things yeah. go, vendor, right? What are your thoughts on this? Because I think right now, and, and I get it, right? Like, you got to finance these things. The vendors are the sponsorships. We get it. Capitalism. Yeah. But... I, I think I feel like the conference has enough clout now that they can kind of start to lean in to do some of those things. Yeah, but think how powerful that would be, right? It, just the, the premise of having, you know, you have civil liberties groups, you have other groups coming in there and say, like, I hear all these things being talked about. Here's what we don't understand or hear how this mm. translates to us. So there's this two-way dialogue that yeah. probably otherwise is not happening. Uh, and um, the conversations that like that would be powerful because then perhaps you even look at these sessions as a way in which um, we're uh, you know uh, focus groups right you're, you're you're doing some you know A/B testing trying to figure out what actually will land right. the right way and where we are getting things mixed up with the terminology in particular so we can actually you know move the ball forward ultimately. <clears throat> that's I like that man. Um, that's a really that's a really good idea. I, I think I, I never really thought about it from that perspective. And it, it reminds me a little bit of, and it's been a while since I've been to Octa's conference. Mm -hmm. I think the last Octane I went to was maybe 2018, and it was at the Aria. Yeah. But one of the things that I did like about it, they they had this whole, they had this like souvenir book that they gave away. I thought it was really weird, but I was like at the time I was like, <laughs> this is kind of, but I like what they did with it. it. Was this? It was this thick book about like this big, and in it they had all these different definitions of what identity was. And it was just but beyond technical, right? Mm -hmm. They were talking about cultural aspects and they had like photography in there. So they had this little theme of like what identity is all of it and what it encapsulates. Right. And I thought Octa did a really good job of leaning in. I don't know if they leaned to it as much since then. Um, we, we all know that they're a marketing company that just happens to be a security company. No knock, congratulations, you guys do that great. 
But I think we could, I think Identiverse which should be like the, the conference to kind of do some of those things, right? And, and to kind of maybe bring more of these uh, ancillary organizations in. One of the things that I wrote about last week was how Apple silently became like the identity company, mm -hmm. if you think about it, right? So for the last 10 or 15 years, they've created an ecosystem with their devices, mm -hmm. right? That allows you to manage a majority of things that you do in your everyday life mm -hmm. through your iPhone, yeah. right? And then connectivity into your laptops, your iPads, and they work with pass keys or work with like the digital mobile driver's license now, yep. all these things. And you know what's, if I find very interesting to me is like, you will never, you never see them here. You never see them at, a, at an identity conference. You don't see them at tech conferences. You go to their page and look for like identity jobs. They don't exist. So it's like they are leading in a lot of the things that we do around identity, but yet are not in the conversation. Right. I kind of find that both interesting and scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like I mean, in, in, uh, to I'm always trying to be fair to people. Uh, like I know that they're you know in, in various groups like like uh, Open ID Foundation and others like they they have representation there. But like again, yeah, to to that point though, it would be great to have more of those perspectives as the, the, the main tech uh, tech builders. You know, one of the things I, I remark on is just the, the adoption of um, Face ID or, or, or the, the fact that folks wanted to use their face to unlock their phone, right? When that was originally talked about, it was rebuked heavily, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until folks saw how the ease of, uh, from a consumer standpoint, how they could, and Apple led the way in doing that, yeah. right? And then ultimately now, across a bunch of different devices, applications, and in particular Microsoft Hello, right? You have you have Google, like all of them were able to move that forward. They had been working in it in the background as yep. well, but like they were kind of the first one out forward in order to do it, and consumer adoption was really the way right. to move forward. So I, you know, I would love to see you know, just uh, more voice, more of their voice into like what they are seeing on the horizon uh, to be able to, to help drive forward. And that way you can take, you know, for, for companies like mine that focus on identity verification and fraud, um, understanding what we're seeing on the consumer standpoint uh, and being able to, to bring the kind of the, the synergy or the nexus between the two of them, because then we can probably find unique ways in which we should be approaching this problem. Right. <clears throat> and, and they're going to be like, as we as we look to to roll these things out, like it's going to happen. So let's. I mean, we, we technology. It's just the way that it runs, right? You brought up the face ID. You know, ten years ago, the thought of biometrics logging was forget about it. Don't even, like don't even bring it up. Right. That's sci-fi stuff. Nobody ever do it, right? Apple rolls out Touch ID. Okay. Two years later, Face ID comes out, and I actually remember the marketing, the commercial they have for it, right? And Apple's always great at this, right? So you, the one that I I, I saw all the freaking time. Was it was like it was this guy? He was in this little market. They had the little jingle going, like right. do 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 yeah. do do do. And the guy's just going around, and he's like using his face, clicking there, whatever. And to your point, like consumer saw, is like, oh, it's that easy. Yep. Right. Oh, so I can use this, and, and then I can and I can use pay and all this stuff or whatever. And they set up this ecosystem of okay, we can identify who we are. We got touch ID, we got face ID. <clears throat> we tie that into Apple Wallet, so easier to pay, so you don't have to have these things. And they just kind of created that pathway. To where, as soon as consumers felt okay, it's we're good, everybody kind of came into this, yep. and it's that now that we have that, people you can't imagine your life without it, right? Like to your point, it's it's in all these different devices. So when I look at where we are now with some of the things that we're talking through with you know Web three and how identity is going to grow, like this stuff's going to happen even faster, right? Like I'm looking at this this mobile driver license rollout. It's four states right now. It'll be ten by the end of the year, right? It'll be all of them probably in the next three years. And they're starting out with like TSA, eventually they'll get to like, you know, alcohol checks, but how quickly do these just roll to like regular social services, right? Mm -hmm. This These things are going to snowball because it's just what technology does and at, at the rate we move. And that's the scariest thing for me because I'm like we, US doesn't have a really good history of looking out for marginalized communities. I'm not going way into that one, but <laughs> what I will say is that, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Like, we're going to continue to see these rollouts um, in particular. You're going to see uh, MDLs, like, they've been worked for a number of years. Now, yeah. I'm probably a little bit uh, more of a pessimist in terms of time, the time horizon for it. I'm going to say there's going to be a lot of energy for it, but, I mean, there's a lot... There's a lot that has to be fixed, right? right? No. Uh, with our just underlying infrastructure today, I view it as broken. Uh, in order to make them actually work in practice, uh, and, and uh, to a lot of these points, is like we talk, we talk about you know connecting them ultimately at the end of the day. Uh, like we still haven't fixed some of the basic tenants that allow you to even get the MDL, right? Like I, one of the things I always harp on 
uh, and then think about different communities that get impacted, right, is uh, the foundational documents that you need, especially since mobile driver's licenses are going to be real ID compliant, in order to assert that it is a real ID compliant, you need a social security card. In a lot of cases, you need a birth certificate. So what happens if you don't got, have of those, right? Like, uh, you know, one of the jokes I always talk about publicly, I may have talked about the last time we were together, uh, is my daughter, uh, my, my youngest daughter, when she was born due to clerical error, um, was not issued social security uh, card. Ha we actually had to go wait in line, social security uh, administration, uh, that was hot Virginia summer day. It was sweating. There was sweat everywhere. Uh, and to, to basically present her in person with my uh, my wife and I in order to say, hey, here is the baby. Can we please confirm that? Uh, wow. Can we get a social security number issued for right? Like, if people and I knew that was important because of the work that I do in identity and right. the, the linkages and the impacts. What happens when all this goes wrong? But what if you don't have time for that? What if your life does not allow you to move in that way? Right? right. What What if doing that type of thing is you taking a bus, you taking off work that you can't afford to do because right. you know you live in paycheck to paycheck? You're not going to do it. And so then you fast forward 20 plus years, they're actually trying to apply and engage in something, and they're being told, no, you actually can't go get this foundational uh, this this thing that takes you to the next level. Right. And folks uh, kind of gloss over it to say, well, you should have already had it. You know, so scary. You're like, no, it's not that simple. So that's right. what I'm saying. Like. I do think that these things will continue to grow, but there's a lot that has to be fixed in the underlying infrastructure in order to get us there. I, I agree, right? The, the reason why, I agree with the, the foundational infrastructure. I guess what I'm more pessimistic about is our ability to stop and actually think about stuff like that before we do it, right? <laughs> I, because I, I just, I, I've, I've watched it. I've seen it do it. It's like, oh, no, it's cool. Like, we'll just roll this out anyway. And it's right. like, no, <laughs> but they will. That, so that, that's my, like, I look at this and go, because the convenience for the minority of people who will use it, like, so you're rolling out with TSA, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to, who's that going to convenience the most? Like, travelers, people who travel frequently, right? People who are in and out and they don't want to use that or whatever. So it's going to go to them. And so I, you're going to lean into that convenience and somebody's going to find a way to capitalize that, which then will push and further the rollout. Is, right. is, and that's honestly my... That's the pessimism I'm afraid of, is that we will do that and won't take the time to look at those other things because, like everything else with tends to be security, we think it slows things down yeah, yeah. and we don't want to do that. Yeah. And I think that's the one area where I would say this can't be capitalistic driven. Like we truly have to think of this as the way we're, tr the way we're talking is trying to roll this out. We have to think of it like a utility, like anything else. Mm -hmm. Because at, at this day and age, like the internet is. Like everything else is like, like we get our water, our gas, and it's, it's something we have to have. So we kind of have to create the infrastructure around it in that way. Yeah. Which, not saying how we do that, capitalist society, everybody wants to get paid, I get it. But it, it can't be as capitalist driven because I, we're, we're going to shortcut it. Yeah, I no, think. I mean, we, so. uh, we, we call today uh, critical infrastructure. We say identity is new critical infrastructure, similar to, 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 to yeah. water, electricity and stuff. And like... I would like to see it protected and thought of in that way, in which you're actually thinking about kind of the holistic impacts of what happens when this goes right and goes wrong, right? Because yes, there are some capitalistic elements associated with it, but more about the social good uh, that comes from it, or when you have it or when you don't have it, right. the impacts for it. Uh, and those are those are changes I, I believe we can and should make uh, yesterday uh, um, in order to, to, to really further this, uh, because it, to this point, it's just gonna become more ingrained uh, at you know, at the end of the day, right? I've been in the identity space for a long time, and, and a lot of us have always said, "Well, identity is important." And now there's kind of been this large wake-up call, uh, right. thanks to COVID, uh, that it is actually everything yeah. uh, nowadays. And it's not like we're going back, right? right. So it, it it has to become the corner, the, the the center of everything that we're doing. So the answer is. You just go back to the public sector and we just go to administration and we go make all this happen, right? Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, moving bureaucracy is, 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 is immediately, <laughs> is, 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 all the time I spent there, I would love to say that, you know, you can do these things overnight, but it, it's, I mean, look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great work that's, that's being done, but it, it, these things take time, it takes energy, it takes effort. And I think that community building and getting everyone on the same page about doing it is actually probably one of the fastest ways to get it done, right? Because like, you know, back in 2018, I used to say that there was a lot of things 
that were, you know, fundamentally broken, right? We used to yell it from the rafters. A lot of things didn't change in government, right, as a result of it. And it's, it's because the, the engine is methodical, it is slow, and it does it on purpose, so you're not having these, these uh, knee-jerk reactions that up in the apple cart, right? And we can try to keep things as stable as possible. Right. Um, that being said, uh, you know, there, there is this piece of the more focus that we have of coming together to do something, the faster it is for us to get that rapid scale adoption. You see that in other security domains when we're talking about things like, you know, supply chain security and others, right? There's groups, there's the government, there's um, private industry, there's uh, nonprofits all coming together to say, this is the way we should go to do this. I see there's no different in identity. Um, for the U.S., again, we, we lag behind what other countries are doing right. uh, because a lot of them are having these types of conversations. Yeah. I know Australia actually sat down with the uh, private sector and actually mapped this out. Uh, and I mm. think for the U.S., from a national approach, like a uh, national strategy related to identity is absolutely needed, but not one on just on paper. It's more with, like one with you know actions, concrete groups that are helping to drive this conversation forward. Australia, huh? Mm-hmm. Maybe I should just move there. <laughs> all right. So with that, look, man, I appreciate you coming out. Take your time. We, I, I'll sit here and talk about these all day. And I know we've got other things to do. So appreciate you tuning in to that Denny Jedi show. We are live from my dinnerverse. Jordan, thanks for coming through. Appreciate you having me. See you guys soon. All right. Cedric Bellamy here at Identiverse 23. Here we go. I saw something that caught my eyes. Now, I always, I always talked about it. If anybody know me back home, biometrics. I don't know if I like the word biometrics because I like the word biometrics, but it sounds important. So here we go. <laughs> Let's get into it. So what's your name, sir? Armin Kabodian. Definitely. So tell us a little bit about biometrics. Well, I'll just tell you, this product is, in my opinion, the most innovative product at Identiverse 2023. And the reason is, is that this product is new to the market, one of a few that have been manufactured. We are pre-production and we are making history at Identiverse. This is a wearable, biometric, multi-factor authentication, FIDO2 compliant, wearable device in a ring form factor. There's an actual fingerprint reader right there. The light, it lights up and now it knows that it's me. And so I don't have to do that two-factor authentication with the passcode and the text message and the SMS and all that garbage. All I do is I hold up my ring to my phone and I've been authenticated. So you got a ring that will take your fingerprint, identify it as you, you put it on, put it with your phone, it verifies, boom. And everybody talking about protect your identity, you're ahead of the game already by a generation. Better believe it. You are Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well, sir. What company that you was, was on the back, but what's entitled? So what do y'all actually do? We do uh, cloud permission management, so providing a cloud native approach to knowing who has access to what and provisioning that access throughout the organization. Definitely. So how important is to understand and know how that works for people that want to get in the industry and apply those skill sets to their future businesses? Well, I think we're fortunate to have a really, really complex world, right? Yeah. Especially in permission management, especially when it comes to cloud resources. So kind of layering that mm -hmm. one on top of the other. Definitely a ton to learn here. I've been walking around, talking to other vendors mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it's been fortunate to have such an amazing group. Yeah, what's your name, sir? Brian. I'm with uh, Complex. 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 So tell us a little about what Complex covers and what Complex does. You can do it all the way to the, the high tech term or the lowest term so a baby can understand it. Yeah, so Complex is a really awesome company. Uh, we are in the ITDR space, meaning we focus on identity security. Uh, our really our core focus, the main differentiator, is really going back to the root of what is identity is validating that who someone is that they say they are, mm -hmm. and we want to just confirm that. And so that's how we bring our technology to market, help companies out, and work with some of the biggest companies in the world doing that. Okay, and so like a lot of that is that entails like I was just talking to somebody else, like something as simple as making sure you got your your, your drive license right. The social security cards and those things are protected as well? Uh, kind of similar. Taking that driver's license example, right? You give your driver's license to a bouncer at a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go ahead and check that. Mm -hmm. We're also going to go back to the MV and make sure it was legitimately oh. issued. I mean, how many times did you show up to a bar with a fake ID? I know I did it. <laughs> we all did it once, right? I and was now, younger. <laughs> I was younger. <laughs> but we want to make sure we're bringing yeah. back that trust to the authentication process of presenting that driver's license at a bar. In a place like Vegas, you got to do it. 
especially out here in Las Vegas. So I ain't going to take no more of your time. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for Absolutely. breaking that down for us. And we'll be back with more interviews, more vendors, and more identity protection. Welcome back to the Identity Jedi Show. We are here in Identiverse live in Las Vegas for Identiverse 2023. It's been a great week so far. We had all these interviews for you. We saved the best for last because he's a 49ers fan. So that's where he's used to being. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Aiden Parisian, welcome, man. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. I'm glad we finally got a chance to catch up. Yep. We've been missing each other playing tag and like slapping to have five. It's across the uh, airport as we've been flying all these miles the last couple of months. But Happy to catch up with you. Just introduce yourself real quick, who you're with, what you got going on for people who don't know you yet. Sure. Uh, Aiden Parisian, I am the Chief Customer Officer at FastPath. Uh, so FastPath, I've uh, been at for about six years. Uh, we were, for a long time, a startup uh, that was bootstrapped, uh, focused on segregation of duties, which is an adjacent space to the identity space, uh, very focused on financial risk and granular access inside of applications. Uh, we entered the identity space about a year ago. We bought a company called Lideo, and so we're here this week uh, at Identiverse 2023, showing off what we got. All right. So talk to me a little bit about where you guys are now with that acquisition, because you're about, it's not even quite a year yet, maybe about half a year in? Two so months short, so August, okay. August last year. Nice. Uh, so as anybody technical knows, uh, getting products to work together is tough. Right. Um, so we, uh, we've got a really good dev team. Um, most folks don't know this, but uh, farm kids make really good developers. Okay. And so uh, we'll, we're just this week showing off our new identity product, uh, which is a parity match to the product that IDEO had prior. Okay. Uh, and so then that'll come out later this year. So we're pretty excited about what we've got. And then that is an adjacency to what we've done traditionally. Um, as you know, we used to partner with SailPoint and Hitachi ID and others because the segregation of duties piece uh, had a natural lead in to identity. Uh, we've seen now that really, you know, SOD is a feature of an identity program. So right. for us to be able to release this as a cohesive platform is pretty exciting. Awesome. What kind of take me back to the thought process when you guys were looking at this and said, okay, we want to make this move with IDEO um, more strategically when you looked at that and said, this is the way we want to go. You know, you talked about it a little bit because, you know, SOD seems like a feature of an identity platform, but those kind of strategic conversations, like we want to do this because we want to position ourselves here. Yeah. So we looked at, from a product, so I used to run product at FastPath. As part of that, we looked at what our customers were asking for. So mm -hmm. some of that is the list of features that they want. Uh, some comes up in conversations, sales calls, or customer success calls. In addition to that, we ran analytics um, through a survey. So we looked at the marketplace. We surveyed a number of people. We did a couple of surveys. We looked at the traditional buyers we used to sell to from a finance standpoint. And then we also went and looked at buyers that were identity folks, people who were using identity tools. In both those surveys, we used a, um, a methodology called outcome-driven innovation. So uh, Tony Ulwick wrote a book called What Customers Want in the 90s. It's popularized that that's become a um, common methodology within the product space these days. And so what that does is you look at the marketplace and you ask a couple of questions around what are you using, what do you need, and then how well is what do you use serve your needs. The bigger the gap, the more opportunity there is. Right. When we looked at that analysis, we saw a natural overflow. We saw everybody in the identity space saying what they really wanted was some of this granular access. Um, same goes for folks in the finance space were saying they needed identity tools. And really what we saw is from a persona perspective, those in the identity space weren't serving the constituency inside of audit because that wasn't a traditional buyer and right. vice versa. And so um, we had already kind of gotten a teaser on that when we'd had identity companies reach out to be partners. Um, so that just kind of rounded that out for us, told us that the, the, the story was true. Um, since we've done that, everyone we've gone to in the marketplace, everybody validates it repeatedly. Nice. People see it, they go, it makes a ton of sense. So that combined overlap, especially with how robust we were as a market leader in the SOD space, um, I think there's a lot of problems we can solve for. So going forward, right, it's, you know, I talked about this maybe last year, I called it into the platform wars, right? We were going to see all this consolidation happen yep. with identity platforms, everybody kind of arming up to offer more of these features to customers. Yep. And so now that we're kind of like full-fledged into that and you guys are kind of, you know, entering that realm as well, what is your outlook on that? As you guys look at, you know, let's say like the next 12 months, just yep. the, the next year of identity of how these kind of platforms, what do you guys see from your perspective and, and what you offer uniquely to that market? And second kind of question to that is, What's been the customer's reaction to this that, you, that yep. you've seen so far? So I think we see the same thing most people see, which is this market 
traditionally was kind of a variety of things. And then it started to boil down to IAM from an authentication standpoint and IGA from an authorization standpoint. Um, I think if you come to a show like this or you go to Gartner's IAM show, really it's an IAM play and everything's starting to become a feature right. of IAM programs. Um, I think to your point, the platform part moves away. You know, Gartner likes to talk about the converged platform and using different products. That said, from a UX standpoint, if you look at business to consumer, mm -hmm. people are expecting a smooth platform experience. They want a single UI. So almost if you split the two concepts, who cares what the platform is as long as what I use looks the same, feels the same. Right. That seems to be where, where that is headed is TBD, right? We've talked about Toma Bravo has an opinion in this space. <laughs> yep. uh, Insight has an opinion in this space. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. For us, we're definitely moving all of our things into a single platform because, again, we feel that what customers are wanting is that that single experience. But you walk the floor here at Identiverse and you see a lot of, of features that are products. And so whether or not those converge into one or whether or not those stay still, it's hard to tell. Some of that's market dynamics. Right. Right. Is there cash in the market? Yeah. And then some of that is what customers are asking for. Uh, what we noticed at the Gartner show is if you looked at things like, um, right, you've got RBAC and you've got PBAC and then you look at uh, ABAC, is that real or not, right? Um, some of the marketing is so far ahead of the curve of what people actually can buy and use <laughs> yes. that it's great, but it's like uh, the analogy I always use is people buy the TRD Pro, which has got the cameras on each wheel to make sure when you're rock climbing, you're on the right rock and then they drive it to the mall. Same thing is there's a lot of features out there that people are buying that they don't maybe need. Right. So whether or not there's a rationalization in the market, we'll see. Whenever things squeeze like this, money gets a little tighter. Yeah. People are going to buy less of the camera pointing at the wheels and more and of the car it. with the trunk space. So right. that when they go to the mall, they take stuff home. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what that turns into. The bigger trunk space for the Costco runs now, right? <laughs> you know what? It'd be interesting to see. I'm pretty sure somebody's done this uh, research report. Totally aside, like, when we get to, like, recession-like... Uh, environments like this, I wonder how much Costco memberships like increase, right? Because like, it, it, it happens every time, right? Things start getting tight, people want to go to Costco, people want to go to Sam's Club, yep. right? So um, just an aside. It's also good for the business, the original AAR model. Yep, exactly. So somebody please research it. I'm pretty sure somebody will send me the comments like, well, actually. <laughs> um, so early, early takeaway so far from Identiverse, customer conversations you have, like what have you been, what's, what's some of the feedback you've been getting? I, a lot of that, I mean, a couple of the comments we've heard is people kind of dazed eyes looking around the room and saying, I don't know what all this stuff does. Right. Um, I think they're having a hard time wrapping their head around some of the new concepts. Um, you get into, you know, dynamic runtime authorization. Again, really cool idea. Right. Right. Chat GPT generate. right? We're talking like magic in a box. I hit a button yeah. and things work. Um, We've had a couple of customers, though, say what you and I would probably say, which is that the reality of actually applying that is wildly different than buying it. Right. Right. And to, to have the sophistication as an organization actually take that magic and do something with it, um, that's going to be harder. And what we've seen, and I've talked to a few other folks at the show this week who are seeing the same thing, is especially in a market like this, sales cycles are becoming more rigorous. Mm -hmm. uh, customers are spending more time validating do they actually need what they're looking at. Right. Uh, finance departments are asking for them to do the extra validation before they spend the money. So I think it's, uh, I think it's the same, same thing. I mean, it's, um, I think people know identity is important. Um, they're not sure which parts are important and there's so mm. much noise in the system, it's hard for them to pull the pieces apart to understand what's what. Right. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's interesting. Like I, I've had conversations about like the last time we saw something like this for the identity industry, right? So, you know, the 2008, 2009 um, financial crisis happens, things, the same things, things are tightened up. But the difference at that time was like, identity was so focused around the administration side of it. Yep. Like, so, so IGA, the SOD, and it's yep. like, so it doesn't matter, like what's your budget, like you're doing this, yep. right? So like, it was like, okay. So identity didn't really get a hit. The, the sell cycles, they get longer. Yep. It, was, it was a little tougher, but it was like, it wasn't a, I'm not going to buy this. It's right. like, I'm going to buy it. Right. Let's just figure out what this looks like. Yep. And so that kind of allowed identity to kind of make it through and come here. And now, if you look at it, having the same thing, but it's, I'm, I mean, for those of us who have been in it a long time, we're happy to see that more people know about it yep. and the conversations are there. Yep. But now we've saturated with them with all these different things, right? Yep. Like literally all these companies say the same thing. What yep. do you do? Yep. I do. Yep. Identity security. What is that? Right. right? And everybody has a different answer. Yep. And so now when it's, it's, it is like, I've got to match feature to actual function. Like yep. Yep. this is my problem. Yeah. 
I need to know how much of my problem you're actually going to solve. Yep. Not what you're going to sell to me, like how much of it is actually going to be solved. Yep. So I would expect like longer POCs, right? Yep. And now when you go to a POC, I'm, I would expect customers actually come to you with use cases like, okay, well, right. here's the 10 things I want to see you do, yep. right? Whereas, yep. you know, last couple of years, it's like, oh, do this. Okay, that looks good. Yep. But so I'm going to be interested to see like how, number one, the marketers respond to it. Yep. Do we... I don't want to say dumb down. Do we simplify the messaging yep. and make it more direct yep. and get to the point? Yep. Like this is what this does and this is what it solves. Yeah. Because I, I do see a lot of confusion in the customers not knowing what's what. Yeah. But I'm also seeing, and I, and I want to get your take on this from the leadership perspective. Not necessarily always CISOs, but maybe the lieutenants. Okay. As security and identity are kind of coming together, like what does this mean and how does this look, yeah. right? So yes, what's the most immediate thing I need to do? But we've been doing identity for a while now, so yeah. like, what's next? Show me the added benefit yeah. that I get in continuing to invest in this. Yeah. Because up until now, we haven't spoken to it like that. Like security, like we know the benefits of why I have to keep investing. Yeah. Why do I need to keep investing in identity? Have you had any of those like type of topics yes. and conversations with customers? Yeah. And that's, so our value pitch as a company in the SOD space was always about solving complex problems simply, right? Our co-founders believe that you shouldn't have to sit in a conference room at somebody's office for 12 months to make something work. And so it was always about how do we build software that's easy to use, it can be used right away, short time to value. Same concept in this space is I think we're at a point where we're gonna to start to see a rationalization of the cost. Because to your point, you know, look at IAM for example, right? Early days, IAM was unique. The idea of doing SAML and doing authentications and passing off tokens, now it's a commodity, right? Right. Anybody can do it. Half the products out there have their own version of it. Yeah. I think IGA and the identity lifecycle piece is next because people are starting to look and say, this isn't that complicated. Yep. You know, why does it have to be this expensive? Why does it have to take that long? Um, that's part of what we're looking at from a market standpoint is we feel that, you know, you should be able to go live in 90 days, 180 days. It should be easy to do. Um, you should be able to do it with a small team. You should be able to do it with a partner that's agile. Um, you shouldn't have to spend, you know, two and a half million dollars to get something live like that. I think that's part of this is you'll start to see that the problem is, is from a vendor perspective, growth is almighty. Yeah. So then what do you do next? Right. So if I, if I have to rationalize the cost that I am, I've got to do a new trick because I need to drive more revenue. Right. right. Same pr problem they got SVB in trouble is where do you try to find the new money? And I right. think it's part of what you see on the floor is people stretching out into the space mm -hmm. to say what's viable in the marketplace. The application of that though is going to be hard. And I think back to your point about the cycles and sea level, it gets hard to sell magic beans at some point, right? Times are tough and right. you're, you as a company are hitting 70% of your number and you're being asked to go spend money on an identity program and to go back to your finance department and say, I want these 12 things. They're going to look and go, well, those first three I get, what's all this? Right. And that's what's going to start to rationalize it. That'll be, it will have an interesting dynamic depending on how long the market squeeze goes potentially that starts to squeeze some folks out, right? Yeah. You're going to get companies that, that can't make the bread they made before because they're not able to, to sell the things that they, that they thought they could. Um, I think you're going to see other companies that may be sitting a little fat from a cost perspective and the margin's thinner than they want. And as that price comes down, that squeeze comes. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, definitely. It, it's going to... I love innovation. I love disruption, right? So I... I initially, I would say it's going to be a rocky two years, but I, th I think it's going to be a fun two years because I think this is also the time that as technologists, as entrepreneurs, right, this is where, like, this, this is it, right? This is where you dig in because this is where you get to figure out, like, what's, what's the next innovative thing? How do I make this better, yep. right? And it's not, and it, it's past building a better mousetrap. It's yep. like, how do I get rid of the mousetrap, yep. right? Like, does the mousetrap really need it? And so that's where this comes out. And we, yep. if you've seen this in business cycles throughout history. It doesn't, it's not just identity, it's anything. Yep. This is where the time where you really have to innovate. And when you have a market squeeze, like, not only have to be innovative from like how you design it, you yeah. got to be innovative in how you build it yeah. and how you scale it and how yeah. you take it to market, yeah. right? Because you're not going to get, no. uh, you know, a blank check to go write it. It's like, go to the grocery store yep. and give me $100 worth of groceries, yep. but you got $10, yep. right? Well, <laughs> so, the budget and that budget gets squeezed every year, yeah. right? And when it's unique and it's, especially when times are great, right? And, you know, you go two years ago when the market's high, there's money to spend everywhere. Right. And the threat is so big and everybody hears it from a board member's perspective during COVID, right? All of a sudden, it's this 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 topic that everybody wants to talk about. It's easy to cordon off those dollars, but over time, what happens to all budgets? Right. All budgets get squeezed. Yeah. Right. Doesn't matter what budget it, well, no. except for maybe sales's budget. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what do you with the, we got two days left at Identiverse? What's what's something you're interested in, in seeing? And have you wait first? Have you had a chance to check out any sessions? I have. Okay. I have. Yeah. Um, 
I, I continue to be interested in the runtime dynamic stuff. Okay. Um, the, you know, the idea of being able to do, especially from our perspective as an IGA organization, authorizations are big. Um, but the idea, the idea that you can do a dynamic runtime risk-based authentication, the fact you can do um, authorization and assertions and that you can hand that off, that concept to me is powerful because I do think that's probably the next evolution is if you can actually create an easy to use and easy to implement version of that, it does solve a lot of problems. Right. It's, it's, it's as it's running. And I hate to talk about generative AI because everything's AI right now, but the reality is, is that is a thing. Yeah. The machine, the ability to, to shorten the cycle of machine learning, right? Machine learning used to be the bastion of really intelligent PhDs. If you can make it available for an average developer to build, you're going to start to put predictive functionality in everything. Right. And once that happens, if you're now saying, well, if you're going to log into your bank account and you log in from Texas and normally you sit in New York and that's going to have a reaction, the ability for all products to have that, there's, obviously there's going to be a boom in that space. Yeah. Uh, you look at Siam and what people are doing to try to reduce the amount of lead time there is to get somebody registered, right? Because there's a cookie at the end, right? There's there's some sort of service you're buying or there's something that you're engaging with. So the dollars are there. That's become a new version of a sales cycle that didn't exist before. Right. Um, that combination of elements is pretty interesting because it's a space that hasn't really been fleshed out much in the past. And it'll be interesting to see what people do to solve it. Um, you know, I, sh shows like this are great to hear some of those pitches. Part of that is you're hearing a lot of vendor marketing pitches. Yeah. It's been actually nice in the hallways to hear what people actually think. Think Right, yeah. And that's those are the conversations I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. No, that's actually, I think one of the things that um, I would like to see, well, I always appreciate at this conference is the hallways conversations, yep. especially at this one, because it's not, it's not just, it's practitioners. Like, it's it's everybody, right? So those, yeah. those hallway conversations are always great. I'd like to see us kind of commoditize that a little bit more and kind of like make that a thing. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably, I'll probably hit up Andy about that. You yeah. know, maybe next year, like maybe we do like a, like you have the sessions, but then like a, like a general like town hall open session, yeah. right? Where those ideas can kind of get shaped. So yeah. look, man, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. So I'm going to wrap up. Appreciate you coming through, man. It's Absolutely. good to see you. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the 49ers another time. Maybe in the next season. Yeah, <laughs> the next season. <laughs> All right, so for that, that is the Identity Jedi Show. We are signing off here in Vegas. Identiverse 2023 has been a great week. Check me out on talk about the future of wallets, we're going to talk about the future of the CISO function, we're going to start talking about the future of the web. And to help us to think about that, uh, I'm delighted to welcome for the first time to this Identiverse main stage, a Jedi. No, really, an actual Jedi. The identity Jedi, to be precise. Dave Wow, that's a pretty good energy for this morning. I, I honestly expected most of you to be hungover. Who went to the beer crawl? A couple of people. 
I can't actually see you, but I'm, I'm assuming you're raising your hands. I'm kidding. I can see all of you. Uh, thanks to Andy for that great introduction. We are going to talk about some things of the future. Web3, I titled it the identity prints that was promised. We're going to get to why I called that in a second. In literary works, there's a trope known as the chosen one. And it's actually fairly popular. I'd be willing to bet that if I asked you what some of your favorite stories were, movies, or books, that one of those would contain this trope. And it's usually an individual that has a predestined destiny set aside for them. They're usually prophesied about thousands of generations before they are going to come and do great things, change the world, lead a rebellion. But they're not perfect. They're usually flawed. In fact, I would say it's those flaws that we love most about them because it's the flaws that they have to overcome. And we're ingrained into the story. We get attracted to their flaws because we want to see how this hero not only has to get all these insurmountable odds, be able to change the future, but how do they do it? And the reason why this is so popular is because we love heroes. We love watching that story. We love rooting for the underdog. We love the big battle scenes. We love the dramatic scenes when they're with their crew, when they don't believe they can actually make a difference. They believe that everything in front of them is too big. They'll never overcome their flaws. We love seeing that because in that we see ourselves. And we think, hey, if this character can do it, so can I. It's why we love these stories. And they're told throughout history. Greek mythology, there was Achilles, known for the Trojan War. He was nearly invulnerable. When he stepped on the battlefield, it was over. Except for one small flaw, hence why we call it the Achilles heel. Stories like Katniss Everdeen, a defiant and reluctant hero. She wasn't predestined. She wasn't invulnerable. She just wanted to protect her family. Specifically, she wanted to protect her sister. And in one moment, one defiant, reluctant moment full of love, she made a simple decision. She volunteered to protect her sister. And in doing that, she lit a spark that would create a fire, that would create a blaze that started a rebellion. One that the people didn't even know that they really needed. She became the hero that they had been looking for, but they couldn't quite put a name on. We love these stories because they inspire. We watch them go through these battles. We love seeing the flaws, they overcome them. How does this flawed person in front of me go through this story? How is Frodo going to figure out how to get to Mount Doom? Yes, I'm a nerd. Thank you. We got another nerds in the house. I would expect it, this conference. <clears throat> but that's what, we, that's what draws us in. It's not about perfection. In fact, if we saw a perfect hero, we would probably reject him. We wouldn't like him. We wouldn't be connected to him. We wouldn't follow the story because there's no fun in that. One of my favorite shows is Game of Thrones. No, I didn't read the books, sorry. I know, I know. But in the show, there's a prophecy kind of woven throughout the story. It's called a prince that was promised. And we later find out, based on the translation of it, it could be prince or princess that was promised. Because sometimes, the hero's kind of a mystery. We don't quite know who or what it is. And in this case, throughout the story, it's told generations before that in this world's greatest need, a new, a new villain will arise, one like the world has never seen before. And at that time, this prince or princess will come back, weave in a flaming sword, and lead the world into this new era. It will be there to protect them at the time in their biggest need. As the season ends, we kind of really don't know who that is. 
We see different characters that get assumed this role. And when I looked at this, I thought it's really not even about whether or not the prince or princess is named, but it's more about the story. Just the mere mention that a character could be this prince or princess saw hope and following. People fled to them, flocked to them, because they saw that this person could be the one to lead them to their next evolution, this new era, this new world. Identity is kind of at that same inflection point. The internet is changing. In fact, I say it's always been changing and evolving since the day of its inception. What started out as a simple experience to see if I could send data from one point to another point, because pigeons and ravens are unreliable, so is the Postal Service. We needed a different way. I want to send data anywhere. And so we built the internet. And at the time, that's all we wanted to do. Send data. Cool. Nerd out together. Here's this document. I'm going to send it to you. Have fun. Read it. What we didn't expect was that this would grow beyond even what we possibly dreamed of. Now, we think of the internet, we've got news, applications, financial transactions, media, entertainment. It's everywhere. We carry it with us in our phones, on our watches, in our cars, in our houses. I would dare to say it's one of the backbones of society. If you don't believe me, throw your phone in the toilet and watch the anxiety arise 10 minutes later when you realize you can't do anything without it. The information superhighway became a real thing. We loved it. It gave us all the conveniences we have today. However, some problems. So you say, if it's so great, Dave, why should we change it? Well, unintended consequences are a real thing. In the last decade, we've all become familiar with the words data breach. I would probably be willing to bet, looking at the number of people in this room, all of our information at one point in time has been breached and is somewhere we did not want it to be. Security and privacy wasn't really a thing when we started to internet, and so we tried to bake it in on top of it as we went. Good efforts, but we're getting to the point where maybe it's time to start asking, if I could do this all over again, how would I do it? What would I do differently? So let's rebuild it. Right now, all of us together. You ready? You ready? Yeah. That, that, there we go. That guy's had three cups of coffee. <laughs> so when we look at Web3, the next generation of it, there's some basic, three basic concepts I want to go over with you guys. And there's a lot more to this, but these three concepts kind of really paint the vision for what we look at the future of the internet would be. The first one, user-controlled identity. As we started growing with the internet, we realized that people had to log on. They had to have these transactions. They had to do these applications. And so what did we do? We put up a bunch of forms, collected a whole bunch of information, and kept trucking. But as we've kind of matured with that, we've realized that, hey, you know, maybe we should include the user in this, give them a little control over the information they share, consent to when it should be used. And so going forward, we picture the user not necessarily being the author of all their data, but the curator of the data that is about them. <clears throat> because it is their data. Just like there's information about you that you have that you decide to share when in any conversation. I'm pretty sure you don't start every conversation with a stranger, giving them the complete rundown of every single detail of your life. If you do, I'd love to talk to you one day. The next aspect is decentralized storage. We've created these treasure troves of information, centralized all this information into applications and made it a honeypot for users to come and get to. This concept of decentralized storage is taking that, encrypting it, and spreading it across many different nodes. Think of this as if I went to a shredder and I wrote a whole bunch of personal information about myself, I put it through the shredder, then I took those pieces and put it across a thousand different trash cans across Las Vegas and said, good luck, go find it. Because if you go through a trash can in Las Vegas, you are a braver soul than I am. Finally, that last concept is those pieces of data become trusted decentralized data. Now that the data has been spread out, we need to make sure that it's data that we actually can trust and that we can verify. 
Because in this new world, it's less about authentication, not saying authentication is not important, but it's more about being able to dynamically authorize and verify what this information is. Instead of having it centrally located at one place and being pulled, it's more dynamically registered and verified at the time of transaction in need. When you really think about it, it's what we've been talking about with the things of zero trust for the past five, six, seven years. How do we get the information we need at the time that we need it? This vision, this future is about giving the user more of that control, which means things around it need to change. But let's pop into user controlled identity. Here's our friend, her name is Teresa Santos. She's got a digital identity record, some typical information, age, education, some licenses, some skills, her favorite quote, whatever it is. The point is, she's the curator of this information. Some of it she originates herself, some of it is originated and verified by others. Her education, we will make sure she was verified. She says she went to Brown, we want to make sure that Brown could verify that she actually did that, provide that information, give it to Teresa for her to curate. She can decide to share that with whoever she wishes. In the real world, if Teresa was walking on the street and you met her, you'd have a conversation. She wouldn't immediately tell you, maybe, maybe she would, maybe she wouldn't, that she went to Brown. It depends on the conversation. At a certain point, how the conversation was going, depending on what you all were talking about, she would relay that information to you. But it's her choice. She controls it. When we look at the future of the web, it's really about making it a lot more interactive in the way we interact in the day-to-day -day setting. Most of us are pretty guarded with our information. Based on how the conversation is going, or how many drinks we have, leads to how much information we give out. So when we look at how we want to build this with user-controlled identity, we want to create controls and services to allow users to do the same thing they do in the natural world in the digital world. Decentralized storage, back to our example. We're going to shred up the data. We're going to encrypt it and spread it across a different set of nodes, multiple nodes. This architecture is not new. We've known about decentralized architectures for a while. The biggest thing here is that in the more number of nodes that the data is spread out, in theory, the security rises because I have to get to every single, every single node to collect every single piece of data and put it together. When I was growing up, my mother loved puzzles, but not like the 500-piece puzzles, like the 2,500-piece puzzles that took like forever to put together. She loved them. I hated them. Kid, impatient. I think it's one of the things that you get older, you like the challenge of putting things together. But the whole purpose here is that we want to make sure that we're not creating honeypots and treasure troves like we have today where users' information can be protected. The likelihood of something getting hacked or broken into in multiple nodes is a lot less than getting into one. In theory. Remember, there's always flaws. It's the flaws that we love. The, out the, <coughs> the output of that becomes the trusted decentralized data. If we're going to break up the data, we have to be able to assure that we can actually trust that data. We know the source where it's coming from. We can verify that source at the right time. And so that way we don't have misinformation getting put out there. When we look at these concepts and we shape them together, we start to look at a very different way that we interact with the Internet. It truly puts identity at the center. Not a marketing term. Sorry, marketers but an actual real infrastructure where when we make a transaction, we're considering the identity of the user, we're considering the identity of the application, we're figuring out what data is which, who is the originator, where it's verified from. Identity truly becomes at the center of every single transaction. Let's look at a use case. We're gonna get back to our bestie, Teresa. I live in Atlanta, and every weekend, specifically on Sunday, it's Sunday fun day. But specifically in Atlanta, it is all about brunch. I have never seen a city more in love with brunch than the city of Atlanta. Like, it is an actual thing. You guys think there's a lot of people here? Come to Atlanta on a Sunday and go to a restaurant for brunch. It's crazy. So Teresa, she's in Atlanta. She's with her friends. She wants to go out for brunch. It's Sunday morning. She's getting ready. She goes to the location. And of course, they're serving alcohol. So it's kind of like Vegas. 
Except a little bit cleaner, maybe. But she's got her friends, and she's getting ready to go in, and she has to obviously provide her ID because there's going to be alcohol. She needs to prove that she's over 21. So in this use case, usually she has this digital identity or she has her driver's license. Today, she would take out her driver's license, she would show it to the security person, they would check it, make sure she's over 21, let her in. But on this driver's license, there's a ton of information that's actually not needed for this transaction. The security person doesn't care where she went to school. The security person doesn't care what her address is. Doesn't care what her skills are, just needs to know if she's over 21. Right now, the state of Georgia, along with three other states, are rolling out mobile driver's license. We can actually have your license on your phone and provide these type of use cases for verification. Right now, they're only rolling it out at TSA, but the point is, when she grabs her phone, she brings up her ID, she knows that she's 26, she just needs to provide that, transaction happens, bouncer has a device that says, hey, provide it, she double clicks her phone, sends a request to say, hey, is this person over 21? It checks, yes, yeah, she's over 21. Sends an actual verified response to the bouncer's device that, yes, yeah, she's over 21. Bouncer knows that she's verified, she gets to go through. Any information about Teresa that wasn't necessary, it's not needed. This new internet looks very much like our normal lives. We give the information needed for the request at the time. It's exciting, a little scary. It prevents a promise of change, but not a guarantee. Remember, heroes are flawed. But unlike the stories that we know and love, instead of just reading and waiting to see how this character is going to get over the flaws, we actually get a chance to write the story as well. Because all of us in this room are technologists, we're agents of change, whether you know it or not. It's our job as we shepherd this new hero into this new phase to make sure that we're asking the right questions and guided in a direction that we want it to be so we can live up to the promise that we see. As we start to look at the changes that are already happening, we're seeing the waves of change that it can have. If you look at finance, it hasn't been perfect, but it's shown promise to be able to change the way we look at finance. Traditional finance today, we have a term called unbanked. There's a lot of people who can't get access to the simple banking services that we all know and love in our everyday lives. Looking at Web3 and decentralization and things such as crypto, they get a chance to do that. But again, it's not perfect. It has flaws. We need to fix it. But it causes us to look at things differently. Think about the employee onboarding process. Right now, when you start a new job, there's a ton of information you provide to your employer. That information is needed for specific reasons. But do they actually need to store it? This new world, this new identity, if we can verify at that time what the information is, you as an employee bring the information, the employer verifies it, can trust where the verification comes from, says I have everything I need to. And if I need to request it again, I know a place where I can come and request it. We start to look at data a lot differently in this new world. How much of it do we need to store? What's the actual cost? One of the things about technology that we've seen, I started out as a programmer, and I started with the C language. And for those programmers in the room, when you had C, you, there was this thing of managing memory because it was expensive. So you were very careful about the data structure you use, the data that you were storing, because you wanted to be as efficient as possible because you didn't have a lot to go with. Over time, we cared less and less about memory. Storage became easier. We just collected more and more data. But now's the time to start asking the questions. It's not necessarily about cost, per se, in the storage aspect of it, but how much data do we actually need to store? What's the actual cost of having that data? If as an organization you were collecting information about a user and we could tag a specific cost, let's say to store social security number, it costs you $25 for every record. Address, that's another $15. First name, last name, $5 a piece. Whatever those values are, if we had actual values tied to this data as we were saving it, we think twice about the information that we save. We'd ask ourselves, do I really need to save this data? What's the purpose of when I need to use this data? These are the questions we have to start asking. Does it mean that employers never save data? Not necessarily, but it's worth the conversation now. 
because we can move in a way in which we can verify it. And finally, consumer privacy. It gets a little scary out there. The internet is everywhere. We've got it in everything, in our homes. I can lock my, my house from wherever I am. I can look at the cameras and see what's going in. Check the mailman, drop something off at the front door. This is the, this is the area in which we live in. This is the world in which we live in. But we've done the consumers a disjustice in that we haven't provided them the tools to keep that privacy. So now's the time to ask those questions. As we're going to rebuild this internet, introduce these new technologies, how are we making sure that we're empowering them to be in the conversation to help protect their data? We're not putting the responsibility on them. That's not fair. They're not building the applications. They're not building the protocols. We are. But they do need to have an active voice. We do need to think about them and what tools we can give them in order to do that. We owe them that much. Technology is not just about convenience. It's about protection. But it's got to be accessible for all. $1,000 cell phones can't be the answer. I know a lot of the conversations, a lot of the technologies that, I'm, that we're seeing focuses around Apples and Samsungs and where these wallets are being stored. We need to make sure that everybody has, has accessible to this. All of us are pretty privileged in this fact that most of us have iPhones, Samsungs. That's great. These phones are expensive. And not all of us can easily get access to those. So if we're saying that this is now the barrier to play, what we're doing is marginalizing a huge section of our population even more so than they already are. Because as we roll these things out, like I said, state of Georgia rolled out mobile data license. Right now, it's only for TSA, but we all know how fast technology moves. 10 years ago, biometrics on a phone, unheard of, not thinkable. Wasn't something any of us were thinking about. Or maybe some of us were thinking about, but it wasn't, it wasn't available. Apple drops Touch ID. Three years later, they, they launched Face ID. Now, the thought of biometrics of phone is an afterthought. Most people use it every day. That's how fast technology moves. As we start to look at this, if we're going to create this new internet, if we're going to provide these ways for users to have access to this, we need to make sure that everybody can get access to it. Because if we start to put it in front of services that the common person needs every day, whether it's to pay your taxes, we saw the fiasco with IDME, or it's to access certain state services, there cannot be a high bar to get that. Because getting these phones is a privilege, but the internet has become a utility. Whether in use or not, it is. We use it for everything. Quick story about the accessibility of this. So I got here on Monday. I had a typical Vegas night. Lost my phone. It sucked. If anybody know Jeremy Roars, he was involved, and that's all I need to say. You know what happened. So the next morning I wake up and I'm like, I'm gonna have to get a new phone. Luckily, as I stated, we're all pretty privileged. Went to T-Mobile, got a new phone, download the iCup Black Up, good to go. A thousand plus dollars spent in a second. Listen, if the 18-year-old me could see me now, they would have had a heart attack. I remember when a thousand dollars would last me for three months. Ramen noodles were cheap. Today was an afterthought. But that's not the case for everybody. So how do we make sure that this technology is accessible to everybody that doesn't have a smartphone, doesn't want a smartphone, can't access the same technologies that we can? We have to make sure we're having those conversations. So to do that, we got to make sure that this new internet, this new age of identity is inclusive for everybody. I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to make a lot of you very uncomfortable. Sometimes these rooms are kind of homogeneous. They all look the same. That's a problem. We got to do better. And we do better by making sure that when we're having these conversations, we stop, we look around, and make sure that it's not the same voices. We're not speaking into an echo chamber that we're inviting more people into the conversation that have different perspectives than we do. Because if we don't, we're gonna miss things. Newsflash, we're all smart, we don't know everything. Some of us think they do, we all know the types, but we don't. 
This isn't something we're building for ourselves. We're building it for everyone. This is digital identity for the people, by the people. So we got to make sure we have all people in the room. So I'm going to leave all of you with a challenge. Two, to be precise. For all the industry veterans in the room, we've seen this industry grow when we used to be screaming at the top of our lungs, identity is important, identity is important, we need to get a handle on this. Fast forward, we now know it's important. It's at the center of all of our conversations. We call it identity security. So for you industry vets, my challenge to you is make sure that as you're having these conversations, you're welcoming new voices. Seek them out. Make them feel comfortable. Ask them their opinions. Receive them with open arms. Use our wisdom as ways to guide and not ways to intimidate. Be cognizant of that because it's important. For newcomers in, if you're just now getting into this industry, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Get involved in the conversations. There's a seat at the table for you. We've been waiting for you. It's reserved for you. Your voice is important. As we look at this, let's not get caught up in the technology. Let's get caught up in the uses. Remember, heroes are flawed. It's what we love about them. Fall in love with this fall hero. Find the ways that we can make it better. Fight the corporate bias. I get it. We work for big corporations. We want those corporations to succeed. We want to be the best that we can be for those corporations. But this isn't something that can be driven by revenue and number sales. It's got to be something that's driven from passion. So I'll leave you with this. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Love each other. For the newbies in the room, these chairs have your name on it. Come take a seat. Let's build a new future together. Have fun. All right, look, that's a wrap here in Vegas, Identiverse 2023. We've seen everything. Showed you the keynote. We got you some interviews. You've seen all the new things that's coming into identity on the exhibit floor. But uh, it's time to go explore Vegas. I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time.